Could a Nazi scholar have understood the ecstatic god Dionysus better than we have? And if so, how exactly have we misunderstood him? Well, imagine, if you will, that you're guiding a school excursion to a local museum and that you're standing in front of this painting over here, asking one of your students to give you their impression. Suppose he replied by saying that it's a painting of four people. Now, although correct, you would probably find his answer a little frustrating, as more was expected. Something relating to the quality of the artwork or to its meaning. And so you address the entire class, this time by asking, what do you think made the artist create this painting? So another student raises his hand and calls for your immediate attention. I know, I know, he says. The reason he made it was that he was walking the countryside when four other people happened to be walking along and he just happened to be holding a paintbrush in his hands. By now, all this should sound rather strange. And it is. But what I'm about to suggest is even stranger. That this is exactly what we do when trying to understand pagan religions. Forgetting that long before they came down as dogma, religions were inseparable from artistic expression. And that art is a product of an impression an impression made by life on a particular individual sensitive enough to receive it, who then tries to recapture that impression by representing it through dance, music, poetry, and share it with the rest of his community. And this was exactly the type of understanding that a German scholar forced to wear the swastika, surrounded by the darkness of war, tried to achieve about the mad god Dionysus and share it with the rest of us. It takes a long time to kill a god, but three great thinkers seem to have really done it for modern man. Darwin, Freud and Marx. So begins the introduction to one of the most important books on ancient Greek religion, its author, Walter Friedrich Otto was born in 1874 near the Swiss Alps. He was originally destined to study theology, but changed to the classics. Although we could say that he never really strayed far from religion, but only made a switch from the view of an evangelical Christian to the wild gaze of the Greek gods. In the rise of the Nazi regime, he was forced to replace the former director of classical studies in the University of Königsberg and was appointed head of a committee that was to oversee the legacy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Working through Europe's darkest hours, Otto was in no short supply of religious symbols as the Nazis were determined to revive parts of what they saw as the mythic heritage of their race, the Indo-Europeans who brought with them the Copts of the Thunder God, Zeus or Wotan for the Greeks and Germans respectively. Hitler's new Rome would be adorned with eagle crest, the swastika, first discovered in the site of Homer's Troy, became the nation's flag, while the lightning runes of Wotan, the German Zeus, would soon become the insignia of the SS. And just as Hitler was being appointed Chancellor in 1933, Otto wrote a book on the Greek god Dionysus. It opens with a story from Plutarch, where the captain of a ship sailing near the island of Paxos was forced to proclaim that the gods were dead. And they were, as around the first Christian century, Greek religion stopped being experienced and began to be read about. So, this German scholar set his own sails to show what Dionysus truly was, back when the mad howls of his Bacchae were heard in the sylvan forests of Greece. His book was met with mixed reception, as some believe that Otto was aiming not as much to a clarification, but a revival of paganism, 
and he was instantly attacked by the Christian church. If we are allowed to sum Odo's views with some permission, we could say that long before religions became dogma and rules were written down in books that came to be considered holy, religions were rituals, cultus or cults, as Odo repeats throughout his book. A sort of performance art of song and dance, the dressing up of animals before sacrifice, the ritual wearing of their skulls, the praying, these performances could and should be appreciated as any other work of art, as the attempt to recapture a vision of what life truly is behind the surface, a vision that comes in flashes of inspiration that are often gone even quicker. Works of art, when seen as holes and not taken apart in the hands of critics, are impressions of life. They are what is left behind when life reveals itself in one of its many aspects to the artist. When the Greek painter Pavlos Samios decided to sit down and paint these passerbys, he could have done so in any number of ways, but instead he chose a style that seems to show life at its loneliest, being alone together. To say that he was a painter of people, therefore, is besides the point, for he was a true painter only to the degree that he showed an aspect of reality that is also true. Likewise, Otto consistently uses the term true God to mean a God that reveals an aspect of life that is also true. And how about Dionysus? Was he really a god of wine and intoxication? Many would think so, and if pressed to explain how his religion came to be, they might say something like, the Greeks like wine, wine makes you drunk, so therefore the Greeks created a drunken god of wine. Which is exactly like saying that Samios simply liked to paint people. As you might have guessed, what is missing in both accounts is the way in which these elements are put together to recapture the artist's unique vision of the world as he saw it. Missing are the howls of women that resonated through the sylvan forests announcing the gods' return. Lost is the holy terror that was felt as strong as the drunken ecstasy and in sharp contrast. In one of the first written mentions of Dionysus found in Homer's Iliad, the god is not even mentioned in relation to wine, but as menomenos, mad or raging. In contrast, the image of joyful Bacchus that we are so familiar with from Renaissance paintings, with Dionysus fat and drunk with a numb smile across his face, was not Greek in origin, but Roman and came from a culture that, while it had the dynamism to conquer the world, it lacked the distinctly Greek sense of tragedy. What is truly missing from the idea of Dionysus as the god of wine is his dual nature. The fact that the same god who was called Polygythes and Plutodotis, joyful one and giver of riches, drove his devotees to madness and death, like in Euripides' Bacchae, where the king of Thebes is torn apart from the hands of his own mother during her ecstasy. There, just like everywhere else in Greek poetry, Dionysus represents the fullness of life, a fullness that once achieved begins to overflow and seeks deliverance in death. The tragic stage of ancient Athens then became the only place where this paradox lied in unity and where the lovable and the horrible lived in close intimacy. Because the Greeks were not the first to discover that death will eventually come and succeed life, but the first to understand that it was there all along, interwoven with its ecstasy, in a way that, to fully understand, one must go mad. 
The basic nature of Dionysus then is madness. And if wine is made sacred by his presence, it's because its pleasure is deep and there is something that flows with it always, something related to tears. And where could this image have come from? Because if Otto was correct when he wrote that the face of every god is the face of the world, then for Dionysus to be mad, much more than drunk, there must be a face of the world which is also mad and one that is accessible to us through ritual. Since the Romantics, it has become commonplace to say along with Schelling that no one can create without a constant return to madness. Only that we don't need to appeal to him since most of us have felt that the urge to create can also be a destructive urge that falling in love is always infused with a feeling of dying into the other. As if the more alive this life becomes for us, the nearer we approach death. And in ways that to fully comprehend, one must go mad. Dionysus then was not the god of wine, but something that wine can also reveal. <laughs> it is surprising how around the time that Otto wrote his book back in Germany, there was little worry internationally of Hitler's potential rise to power. But at least one man begged to differ. He was the father of depth psychology, Carl Jung, who, much in line with Otto's writings, saw in the fascist dictator an incarnation of Wotan, the Germanic thunder god equivalent to Zeus. Jung did not care much about the geopolitics of Europe, but its mythology, and recognized in Hitler not a political, but a mythical presence. And as much as we're trained to dismiss anything that does not conform to scientific analysis, Jung's essay, also titled Wotan, depicted something that all the rationalists of Europe could not. And if Wotan could be seen guiding the Third Reich, then Dionysus can be seen throughout the 1960s, where the youth across Europe and the US was struck by the same impression of life that first created the mad god. We can keep insisting that views like those of Odo and Jung are nothing but fairy tales for adults, and that ecstasy can go without ever leading into terror and that what happened to the city of Thebes in Euripides' play Backheim can never befall Europe.